And as you notice, we're in the final chapter of the Revelation. Uh, this has been a wonderful, wonderful study. Uh, we started it August of 2013, and it probably will be thereabouts when we finish up. Uh, we've been in it uh, about two years, a little more, a little less, because there is so much in the Revelation that you need to hear. You need to learn. Every Christian needs to read and study the Revelation. Now, when you read the Revelation, let me just mention, a lot of times, you know, we say, well, how do you understand? What does this mean? Uh, unless there is a place in Scripture that gives you a, an interpretation of that, you need to take it literally. Now, you say, now, Pastor, how in the world can you take some of the things that are there literally? They're so far beyond your mind's imagination. Well, if you'll think with me for just a moment, it's not really that hard. First of all, think about the world that you and I live in. It came out of nothingness, didn't it? God said in the beginning, and he spoke everything into existence. I was thinking how hard it is to believe some things. Uh, you know, if I had told you, you know, back uh, 30 years ago, you said, you know what, you're going to have a device that you can, you know, look into it, and you're going to be able to see people from miles away, and you're going to have it right in the palm of your hand. You might have said, well... That may be someday with technology, but can you imagine if our parents and our grandparents and great-grandparents, we told them that? I can imagine if I told my grandpa Burchett, Grandpa, I want to tell you there's going to come a time that you're going to have this little device in your hand, and you're going to be able to see people all the way to China if you want to, and uh, you're going to be able to send out lightning-fast messages within a second, you're going to be able to buy anything around the world with that little device. My grandpa would have said, Honey, I love you, but we need to go someplace. Because it would have been out of their imagination. Uh, and there's a lot of things that are out of our mind's imagination, but we need to read it literally. And let me explain why again. First of all, whenever you get to the book of the Revelation... You've read Genesis all the way through the book to Revelation. And how do you read the rest of the Bible unless it shows symbolism? You read it literally, don't you? The Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we don't take that figuratively. We take it literally. God uh, breathed and God made everything in six days. Well, was that 6,000 days? Was that an era of time? Was a day... You know, how long was a day? Was a day 100 years, 250 years, 1,000? How long was a day? Well, God himself defined a day. He said a night and the morning was the first day. And so he defines it. And so you've read 65 books. And when you get up to the Revelation, you have read the Bible, taking everything that you could literally, unless there was symbolism and God would reveal it and he would show other things as well, and there would be commentary. So you need to read the Bible and you need to read it literally. Now, I recognize there are some things that are hard to understand, but you need to take it at what God says. Now, when you come to Revelation chapter 22, let me just reorient you to a few things. Revelation chapter 3, the church is off the scenes, the church is raptured. There is no prophecy in all of the Bible that must take place before the rapture of the church. Why is that important? That means that the Lord could come at any time. That, so that means that at any moment, any time, it would be in the keeping of the Word of God that God could take the church out of this world and then it would set in motion the tribulation. It would set in motion the seven years that will take place. The tribulation and then in the middle starting the great tribulation. And so when you look at... Uh, Get to Revelation 22, that is already passed. Well, you look at all the things that have taken place. You look at uh, the trumpet judgments. You look at the uh, seal judgments. You look at the bowl judgments. They've already gone. They're already over. They're already passed. This earth that you're on right now, when you come to Revelation chapter 22, has been done away with. Just as God breathed this earth into being and brought it into being out of divine energy, so the Bible makes it very clear at the great white throne judgment, even before, God is going to take this earth back into divine energy. There is coming a new heaven and a new earth. This earth is going to be completely done away with according to what we understand in Scripture. Because John says that there's going to be an earth in which there's no sea. In other words, you're going to live in a world that is not water-based. 
The world you're living in now is water-based. You're water-based. You have to have water. Uh, everything around us, three-fourths of the earth's uh, uh, ma- land mass is water. But you're going to live in a world that's not going to be oriented. It's not going to have the laws of evaporation, condensation, and all of that. That is not going to be a reality in the new earth and in the new heaven. Now, the rapture, the tribulation, the rise of the Antichrist, that has already taken place. You remember that there is going to come a rise of the Antichrist. We don't know who he is, where he is. If the rapture takes place this year, next year, that means the Antichrist is on the scene even now. You don't know who he is. I'm saying if the rapture takes place. If the rapture doesn't take place for 100 years, then he's not alive. You say, well, how do you know? You don't know. That's left into the mind of God. But when you come to Revelation chapter 22, the rapture is over, the tribulation is over, the millennial reign of Christ, the rule and reign of Jesus Christ on this earth for a thousand years is over. Now, when you look in Revelation chapter 21, you remember we looked at the new heaven and the new earth. And I I really wish that we just had a lot of time to deal more and more with that. We may do that a little bit later on in just a specific study. But when you come to Revelation chapter 22, I want you to look in verses 6 through 12 tonight because we're looking at the coming of Jesus Christ. In other words, we're looking at the imminency of Jesus' coming. So I want you to follow along beginning in verse 6. And John says these words, an inspiration of the Spirit of God. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servant the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of this prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See that See thou do it not, for I am a fellow servant, and thy brethren the prophets of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. And he said unto me, Seal not the sayings of this prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now, in verses 6 through 12, John, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, is making an announcement. God is making an announcement, really, through John. And if you'll notice verses 6 and 7, first of all, God makes it very clear, these sayings are faithful and true. Now, be reminded what God has been saying all throughout the Revelation. Be reminded how hard, it, I'm sure it probably, you know, we're, we're able to see more and more how things can be. You're seeing people fall into the earth. Uh, I was looking on, uh, someone put it on Facebook, uh, this girl walking along in uh, Korea, ground opened up and she dropped in. Uh, this golf course in Oklahoma, at the opening, one of the opening holes, ground opened up and just a lot of things. Bowling Green, the Corvette Museum, the concrete drop and all the cars Four or five, six, seven cars just dropped in. And we're starting to see now, all God has to do is just change the earth, tilt it, do whatever he wants to. And and what God makes clear, there's going to be 100-pound hailstones. That's what he says. If God says there's coming blood over a span of 200 miles, it is going to happen. If God says a third of the rivers are going to turn rotted, going to turn sour, polluted, that's going to take place. And, uh, you know... You and I, whenever you look at the context of Scripture, we can know that they'll take place, and here's why. God has a perfect track record. Think about this for a moment. God told, uh, uh, God told Noah that I'm going to bring a flood. He told Noah, he said, I want you to build a ship. I want you to, and 120 years he worked on that ship. Finally, the day came, the time came. Noah got into the boat. All the animals were summoned from the face of the earth. They got in the boat, and God caused the rains to come. And when you look at why, because God decreed it so. Folks, the tribulation is already decreed by the hand of God. The great tribulation is already decreed by the mind and hand of God. So it is going to happen. The earth has already decreed to be destroyed. Now, 
you know, people talk about saving the planet and we need to be very conscious. We need to be environmental friendly. We need to do what we can and do our part. But this earth, the next time it's going to be destroyed, the Bible says, Peter says, it's going to be destroyed with fervent heat. And so uh, God declares that there's going to come a time that it is going to take place. And uh, as I said, if it doesn't happen, John is a liar. And uh, how, do you, how can you believe the rest of the Bible if this is in jeopardy? Now think about it for a moment. If this is in jeopardy and is not truthful, then how do you know that God loves the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have, ever turn, have everlasting life? It's in the same book. And the reason being is as, as legitimate, truthful, and right, and righteous as John 3.16 is, you can take it to the bank, these things are going to take place. So the reality is, you and I need to get into our mind. All the events of Revelation are coming to pass. There are coming trumpet judgments. There are coming seal judgments. There is coming the wrath of God. There is coming a literal person who is the Antichrist. There is coming the thousand-year reign. And when you get to Revelation chapter 22, verse 6, the Lord makes it very clear the Son of God is going to come back. And, you know, it's, it's an announcement. You know... And, and you, I heard, I shared with you just a moment ago, there's no prophecy that has to take place for the rapture. And, and I believe there's a, we need to hear that. In our day and time, you know, we, Christians take so lightly their Christian faith. We need to be serious. Why? Because you don't know when the Lord's going to come. You don't know when he, and whenever he comes, everything is going to start in a motion by his divine plan. So the call of Jesus coming is, is imminent. The word imminent means he may not come today, but he could come. The Bible makes it very clear. He's first of all going to come on clouds. and That's exactly what's going to happen. And the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. And those who are alive will rise to meet him in the air. How many of you are absolutely sure Jesus won't come today? How many of you, I would bet, is doing something you shouldn't? And they said, I'm going to come back and you're going to... I'm giving you this chore. I'm giving you this task. I'm giving you this responsibility. I've heard people tell about stories of them being in a classroom and you know climbing up on desk. The teacher got out, and all of a sudden the teacher came back, and there's on, and uh, they didn't think they was coming back for a while. And uh, you know, I've I've had a, an experience or two in my life, and I guarantee you, you have. When your parents said, "Well, you know what? They're going to be gone for a long time." You really don't know. And that's what Jesus is saying. Listen, the announcement in Revelation is not to unbelievers because unbelievers, in reality, the only thing they can listen to is the gospel. And what God is saying in Revelation chapter 22, verse 6, He said, I want to announce to the believers I'm coming quickly. And there ought to be great comfort in your life and my life in that because, you know, there's going to come a time that the Lord is going to catch us up. Wouldn't it be awesome the Lord caught us up right in the middle of vacation Bible school? Maybe you're saying, oh, Lord, if you come, come before vacation Bible school. But, uh, but you're going to be caught. And so, first of all, he says, I'm coming quickly. And, uh, you know, some would say, well, why don't the Lord go ahead and come back? Well, it's not the will of God that any man should perish. And once the Lord comes, it's going to ignite. Can you, you can't imagine. Can you imagine what's going to happen at the sudden rapture, the taking up? Let's suppose there's going to be a loss of maybe three to, well, maybe 30 million people in the United States, maybe 50 million. Can you imagine the workforce? Can you imagine the taxes that's going to be on everybody else when all of the Christians are raptured? How many other people are going to have to fund America? Can you imagine what's going to happen? All the catastrophe, all the looting, all of that. In other words, and, and Jesus said, I am coming quickly. Now listen carefully. The word quickly is the most powerful word that can be used in this context. And Jesus is saying, I want you to understand. I want you to know. I want you to get it into your being that I'm coming immediately. I'm coming with imminency. I'm coming suddenly. In other words, it's looming over the horizon, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Christians who are walking in obedience, we ought to say like Peter, even so come Lord Jesus, right? I get tired of this world sometimes, don't you? Now, I don't want to do anything to myself. And I don't want Charlotte to do anything to me. 
But don't you get tired? You know, you get tired of living in this wicked and depraved and ungodly world. So first of all, he says, understand it's coming. Second of all, the call of Jesus coming is a serious call to obedience. Notice what it says in verse 7 and 8. He says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Look at the phrase. Blessed is he that keepeth the, the prophecy. In other words, God announces to all who read, there is a blessing to those who keep the prophecy, who keep the words of the prophecy. And you know there are certain types of obedience. There are certain types of, of obedience when it comes to a Christian's life. Well, I obey because you know, God will zap me if I don't. That's not the obedience God is talking about. God doesn't want you to obey just to, because you're afraid that he might zap you or do something to you or, well, you better obey because, you know, God has power. He can take your family. That's not what John is talking about at all. John is talking about an obedience that stems from a heart that is thankful because God has redeemed you and saved you and given you eternal life. Think about it. If God hadn't redeemed us, where, where's our next assignment after this life is over if God hasn't redeemed us? Folks, you're, you're set for eternal doom. Damnation, torment, hell, Gehenna, whatever word you want to use. And so the person who seriously keeps the words of this prophecy, they're a person who realizes, number one, they're forgiven. They're forgiven. Their sins have been forgiven. Their sins have been washed away. And you know, whenever the rapture comes, if it takes place in our lifetime, you're going to be caught up in the very act of doing something. Now think about this. Imagine a husband and a wife are right in the midst of arguing and fussing and saying all sorts of things that aren't kind of... Do you realize there's going to be some that are going to be raptured right in that moment? There are going to be some that are raptured. They're going to be in the middle of praying. There are going to be some that are raptured. They're right in the middle of walking down the road or they're right in the middle of, of parking their car. Or they're right in the middle of flying on an airplane. They're right in the middle of park, you know, whatever it may be. And we're going to be raptured right in the midst of doing something. And it ought to be a life of obedience. That's what Jesus is saying. I want you to understand I'm coming, and it ought to prompt you to immediate obedience. I mean obedience in your daily walk, obedience in the way you conduct your mouth, obedience in the way you treat your wife. I saw a little thing on Facebook, and I couldn't help but post it. It said, he who treats his wife like a thoroughbred won't have to live with a nag. I don't know about that. I mean, you know, you, we ought to treat... But here's the reality. John, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, says, we ought to be obedient. Why should you be obedient? Because of the goodness of God. And then, look at number three. The coming of Jesus is a call to serious worship. Notice what it says in verse 8 and 9. I, John, saw these things. I heard them, and when I had seen them, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Now, let me say first of all, I don't believe that John meant to worship an angel at all. But I think that whatever John experienced, his heart... His soul, his spirit was driven to worship. I was looking at some gems last night. I was looking at some amethyst. I was looking at some topaz. I was looking at some other emeralds. All on this thing called Pinterest. I don't know what it is, but I just saw them on there. And I tried to get in my mind's eye 1,500 miles of that. Can you imagine, can you imagine once you arrive in the heavenly city, once you have your glorified body, once you see Him, once you see the Lord, and John said, I fell down to worship. Folks, we need to get a good understanding of worship. I, I really think we're getting all mixed up whenever it comes to worship. We, we don't have a good understanding of what worship is. Uh, I don't know when I was a kid if I had a good understanding and and sometimes we think, well, you worship whenever you sit in a church. Well, you can, but you can sit in a church pew. Have you ever sat in church and your mind has been something else and the pastor has said amen and then you thought, what was said? I know that's not happened to any of us. But we need to get a good understanding of what worship is. 
Now let me tell you, if you're going to worship the Lord and going to worship the Lord right, it involves four things out of each of our lives. First of all, once you look at number three, John announces in verse 8 what he's allowed to see, and it's almost as though John says, I want you to know it was me. It was me God used. God let me see things, and, and, I, and, I, and he, he allowed me to, to, to see things that are beyond human comprehension. And he said, my only recourse was to fall and worship. So, you know, some have asked, what is worship? Is it, you know, sitting in a church pew? Is it uh, just listening to the preacher preach? Well, I want you to look real carefully, real quickly. First of all, there has to be trust in God to worship. You can't worship God if you don't trust Him. Now, here's what worship does. You know, in the Old Testament, whenever they would pray... Oftentimes they would start their prayers, the God of creation, the God who spoke and it came into being, the God who is the great I am, the one who was and is and is to come. And they would talk about the attributes of God. And and first of all, and you don't have to turn back there, but David in Psalms 26 gives you and me a good handle on, on worship. Watch us sometime. Watch your own life. Can I tell you this? If you can't trust God, you can't worship Him. Because a divine reality is this. If I worship God, I have come to a point in my life where God, I don't understand everything. I don't know everything, and that's a given. But I know you know everything. And like Paul said, all things work together for good to them who love God. Everything's going to work to good if you love the Lord. So it involves trust. You know, David could trust God. Why? God's got a good track record. But isn't it amazing how we don't think God does have a good track record? Lord, what are you doing to me? Have you ever said that? Lord, what are you, why are you allowing this to happen to my life? You know what that says? David said on another occasion, what time I'm afraid, I'll trust in the Lord. Then he said, I'll trust in the Lord and not be afraid. I like that one better. But he said, first of all, it involves trust. Second of all, It involves a preoccupation with the loving kindness of God. I've been pastor for a little while, and can I tell you one thing that intrigues me? How many people just don't really believe God's that loving and that kind? Do you realize, God, you you cannot even comprehend today how many times God has thought about you today? You can't. The Bible says you cannot even fathom in a day's time how many times God thinks about you. And David, whenever he looked at the hand of God, well, look at your life. When you was a child, did you ever think you'd have what you have? Look at some of the possessions you've got. I remember one time when I was a kid, boy, I thought I was right uptown. I went in my room and I counted all my toys. I can remember this to this day. I went all the way around my room and I lovingly kind to you. David says, your loving kindness is always in front of me. That's true worship. When you think right about God, the problem is we've got some warped views about God in our mind. Now, I want, to listen. I want you to listen to me very carefully. You've got a view of God in your mind. The question is, is the God in your mind the God in the Bible? Well, you say, yeah, that's what my mom and dad told me. I can't tell you this powerfully enough. When I was a kid, I thought, I better be good. God's going to get me. You know what I'm talking about? Because it's real easy as a parent. You better be good. God saw you do that. God's going to get you for that. You know, we sort of like to use him as an extra disciplinarian for, for our lives. But David said his loving kindness... You know, when you become preoccupied. Now, I don't mean to boast in her, but I do. I have a wife that's wonderfully loving, kind to me. About us. Look at the way we live. Look at the way we treat him. We come to church on Sunday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday night. We can't get out sometimes quick enough. Why? Because our mind, for some reason won't allow us to think, or we've been programmed, we don't think about the loving kindness. David said, you're loving kindness. You're continually kind to me. You're continually loving me. God, I can't stand it. You're so good to me. D.L. Moody, a preacher of years gone by, 
he was thinking about the goodness of the Lord and the joy of the Lord. And he was walking down a street and he knew the people. He knocked on the door and he said, could I borrow your back room? And, and uh, he got in the back room and he was worshiping the Lord, praising the Lord. And he said, Lord, stop. Because the joy was just overwhelming his soul. And it, think about the joy of the Lord. As a matter of fact, David said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So real worship, you think about, you concentrate on the loving kindness of God. But a lot of times, as you and I have lived our lives, we've, you know, we'll hear preachers that don't come across very loving, very kind. The nature of God is, though. You can't change that. And then, fourthly, or third, a desire to walk in truth. I want you to notice something. In uh, verse 4 of Psalm 26, I have not said it with vain persons, neither will I go with dissemblers. He said, I have walked, verse 3, in thy truth. L let me tell you, if you're going to worship God right, you want to learn the truth, study the truth, know the truth, absorb the truth. And you shouldn't feel odd if you're a child of God, that the Bible is a priority in your life. You ought to be glad. You say, well, you know, don't you need to read other books? Yes, read other good books, read other Christian books. But David said, I, I want to walk in your truth. You know, our fallen nature, we just like to hear good juicy stuff sometimes, don't we? Did you hear the latest? That's our fallen nature. David said, I love your truth. And then fourthly, this is, there's no desire to be involved with evildoers. David made it real clear. He said, I have not sat with vain persons. Now, why is that so important? Because it's the same reality in John in Revelation chapter 22. John loved thinking about God. John loved focusing on the loving kindness. John loved being with a family of God. You know, one of the highlights, the highlights of, of my week are coming together with the family of God. You know why? Because we're brothers and sisters one with another. Coming together and sharing in burdens and prayers and also sharing in good times as well. And so, you know, when it comes to loving kindness, when it comes to a preoccupation with the loving kindness, when it comes to the fact that focused on truth, you can't worship God and, and, uh, and, and those not be a part. There's some people who say, well, you know what? I want to go out on Saturday night and party, and I still want to go to church on Sunday. Well, you can go to church, but I can tell you this, you will not worship God. You say, well, yes, I can. No, you cannot. You say, well, yes, I can. No, you cannot. I can tell you biblically, you cannot worship God, and here's why. You cannot desire to tolerate sin in your life and at the same time want to worship the God that despises sin. What would you do if I said, you know what, church, I need to tell you, I, I love my wife and I'm faithful to her on Monday through Friday. But I need to tell you this. Well, you'd say, well, let's throw him out right now and I'd second the motion. You know why? God can't tolerate sin and when you and I want to handle it, and we want to participate in it. We want to be involved in it. That is an abomination to God. And John said, I worshipped him. I fell at his feet. And I worshipped him. Well, then fourthly, we have so much that we could say on that. But just to show you that that's what true worship involves. And, you know, it involves thanksgiving and praise and a love of the presence of God. And by the way, you ought to love being here. Now, there's always dynamics. You say, well, I'm tired. I understand that. But we ought to love the opening of the Word of God where God speaks to us and teaches us through His servant. Now, I have always liked to live by the philosophy, and I'll say it again, because sometimes I get in such a way that, man, I wish I could preach two hours. But I've got such good deacons that they love me so much that they would come to me and say, now, Brother Benny, no, no. But here's what I've gone by for years. The mind will only intake what the seat will endure. Amen? You can say amen because I've been on that end too. And Mike is saying, absolutely, dear pastor, absolutely. But so worship, a preoccupation. Are you preoccupied with the things of God? Are you preoccupied with the desire to be in the Word of God? Let Him speak to you. John said, when, when I experienced these things, I fell, I worshipped. 
And that's what worship is. And then lastly, a warning to those who reject the prophecy of Revelation 22. You know, Jesus makes it very clear, I'm coming. But there is a strange verse that is found in verse 11. And it's a very strange verse. I want you to look in your copy of the scripture at verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. Now you may say, well, pastor, what in the world is God saying through that verse? Well, I don't think it could be said any better than what Dr. John MacArthur said some years ago, back I think about 1970, 72. If the warnings of the Bible are not sufficient to change a man, then God has no more to say. Let that person be unjust forever. Now think about it. We live in a world where how can we bring people to Jesus Christ? How can we bring people to the Lord? They won't listen to the Bible anymore. So how do you listen? If they don't listen to the Bible anymore, God says let them be unjust forever. How do you reach a person apart from the word of the living God? How is a person convicted of sin, of judgment and righteousness apart from the word of God? You say, Pastor, you need to go someplace. (laughs) You're here because you chose to be here. You're here because you wanted to worship your Lord. You're here because you wanted to be with brothers and sisters. You wanted to sing the songs of God. As Brother Mike led, you wanted to hear what God had to say through his word. And and what Jesus is saying is there, there is a person that is not going to be reached with the gospel. We don't want to say that, but folks, we might as well be honest with ourselves. There's a type of person that will not believe the gospel. It's that person who yearns for unrighteousness, who yearns for sin, and is willing to say, you know what, I could care less about the gospel of Jesus Christ, let me have my sin. And God says, let them be unjust. Let them be filthy forever. You see, here's something that you and I need to understand. You know death will not change you. You won't become more righteous in heaven. Death crystallizes what you already are. If you're a peripheral Christian, you say, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to be so much more faithful. No, you're not. Death will crystallize for eternity. That's why God can reward you. Think about it. You know nobody's been rewarded yet, by the way. There's not a saint that's been rewarded that's died that's been rewarded. You say, well, they've not been. Oswald Chambers, one of the great men of God who I read, who wrote the most profound devotional, my utmost for his highest, Billy Graham, you know, when the Lord calls him home, he won't be rewarded at his death. So many others, John the Apostle has not been rewarded. Paul has not been rewarded. And you say, why haven't they been rewarded? You won't be rewarded when you die. You know why? Your works will live on. People will be talking about you. But the reality about it is, is your type of life will be crystallized in a sense where you know the people that you talk about. Man, they're always at church. There's some people you think, you know, if they don't come, we go check their house, right? Well, Paul or John is making it very clear. And that person who's unrighteous. You see, the Bible says it's not the will of God that any should perish. But Jesus also said, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And many there be that find it. Don't you ever tamper with the message of the gospel just to win somebody. Amen? Isn't it amazing how much the gospel is soft-pedaled anymore? Well, you don't have to really be serious. Just say these words. Just say these, these simple words, and if you mean those simple words, say them, you're saved and everything. No, I'll tell you what Jesus said, if you love me, you'll what? You'll keep my commandments. You'll do what I tell you to do. You'll follow my word. You'll believe my word. You'll practice my word. And then lastly, very quickly, 
Time is out. A final reminder, the Lord is coming quickly. It's, it's like the Lord doesn't say it enough. He said it in verse 7, but then he says, Behold, I come quickly. But here's what he says, And my reward is with me. Now listen carefully. He don't just say, I'm coming, but he says, My reward is with me to give to every man. Now man also means woman. Every person, every man and woman. He's going to give to you what you have coming to you. You say, oh, I don't want him to give me what's coming to me. It's coming. You see, if you've not been faithful, if you've not been obedient, if you've not been a servant of the Lord, then you know you don't really need to expect a whole lot. In a black congregation, I heard a black preacher saying this one time. You know, the service would go on based on the person's faithfulness. If a person had been faithful for 40 years, you could expect maybe two, two and a half hour message. And this one uh, person just joined the church, but they weren't faithful. And, and uh, he said uh, to his pastor, he said, Now, pastor, when I die, he said, I don't want a long message. And this black pastor said, Oh, my brother, you don't have to worry. It'll be very short. What about your life? Listen to what Jesus himself says. I want, and put your name in there. Benny. Behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give to Benny according as his work shall be. That get, gets real close to the vest, don't it? And my reward is with me to give to Don, to give to Mike, to give to Rhonda, to give to Charlotte, to give to Diane, to give to June, and put your name in there, to give to Ralph, according as your work shall be. And here's the reality. If you've not been faithful to the Lord... You're not going to get much. Can you imagine? There's a song we used to sing. Must I go an empty handed? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul with which to greet him. You see, the sad part about it is, I want to say this in love, a lot of folks never learn how to share their faith. Never win anybody to the Lord Jesus Christ. Never know how to know anybody and don't want to really know how to lead somebody to faith in Christ. There's something radically wrong if you don't want to know how to lead somebody to faith in Christ. But here's what he said, and it's going to be given to every man. So here's what John says. I want you to understand Jesus is coming. We need to be obedient. We need to be worshiping. We need to be serving. We need to be giving of ourselves because you don't know but what the rapture could take place today. So as we get ready to have vacation Bible school, let's give it everything we've got. As we see these kids coming, you don't have to get on your knees, but pray for them. As you look at them, pray for them. Breathe the prayer for them. Ask God to move in their heart and their life. Pray so that lives can be redeemed. With heads bowed, eyes closed, I'm going to ask us just to have a time of personal prayer. Personal prayer for our